Hey guys, here we are, part two on election this week. I'd encourage you to go back and watch part one first because then it's easier to follow. And we also have a full five-part teaching series that you can download full teachings at www.johncrowder.net. Last week, I said that we have to see all of election through the lens of the one man, Jesus Christ, that God was not picking one individual over another for heaven or hell, but that he picked Christ as the elected one. We also dealt with the question of God's justice regarding hardening, blinding, rejecting individuals. And I said that we've looked at it backwards, okay? Romans 9, 14, we wrongly saw this as questioning God's fairness to harden some. But Paul was actually dealing with a perceived injustice of God's inclusion of Gentile sinners on the promises, totally apart from their good works. I also stated that Romans 9 through 11 says nothing at all about hell and the hardening, blinding of some unbelievers is here in part, Romans eleven twenty five. 25. So it's obviously not an eternal hardening that he's talking about in these passages. We can't say how any individual responds to the Lord on Judgment Day. You don't know how the eternal fate of, of Pharaoh turns out any more than Mother Teresa. You can only perceive their temporal existence. So just trust Jesus with your own salvation and leave it be at that. Now let's deal with the whole Jacob and Esau or Moses and Pharaoh thing for just a minute. We've missed Paul's usage of the Jacob and Esau analogy. Jacob and Esau exist in these passages not merely as two individuals, they exist in a representative capacity. They're images of a bigger picture. The same is true with Isaac and Ishmael, Moses and Pharaoh, the children of the flesh versus the children of the spirit, the old man versus the new man. Rather, these are two modes of the same person, your true nature in Christ or your false nature in Adam. Now you may say, wait, that's a stretch. This is not a stretch. This is the whole premise of Paul's argument about the true and false Israel. Chapter 9, verse 6, Jacob is Israel. Israel is literally his new name. Israel is both a vessel of mercy and a vessel of wrath in these passages. It's not as simple as Jacob being the good guy here. The scriptures make Jacob and Esau both out to be good and bad at different times. There are tons of passages where Jacob faces his own judgment. Amos uh, 6, 8, Micah 4, 5. God hates false Jacob. He's a cheat, a conniver, a swindler. His name was changed to Israel. God does not hate Esau, and not the individual Esau. He hated what Esau represented. He hates false Esau. When Jacob and Esau are reconciled together, in Genesis 33.10, Jacob says of Esau, he says, for to see your face is like seeing the face of God now that you've received me favorably. Is this man whose lineage God blessed, whose face was like the very face of God, was he literally hated by God and damned to eternal perdition from before he was born? Look, Esau, the individual, was used as an object of wrath during his lifetime. But God never hated Esau. God doesn't hate anybody. God hated what Esau represents, unbelief, the sinful self. Paul builds his whole argument up to Romans chapter 11, where he includes hardened Israel. Israel in the salvation plan. He puts Israel, Jacob, Esau, Moses, Pharaoh, all of them on the same level of disobedience so that he can have mercy on all. Now we'll come back to the question of God's justice, but let's just look at the next verse for a second. Romans 9, 15, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. We've looked at that verse backwards too. We thought he was talking about random selection, the indeterminacy of God's mercy. We've assumed that he's also saying the opposite there, that on the flip side, he'll curse who he wants to curse. But that's not what he's saying. This verse is really about the solid intensity of his mercy. I can bless whoever I want, even the Gentiles. It's connected to Moses seeing God's goodness, his glory in Exodus chapter 33, 19 through 20, where he says, I will make my goodness pass before you and I'll be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy on whom I'll show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall 
not see me and live. Do you see? Death to self is required for this union. We must be crucified with Christ to see his glory. Jacob and Esau represent two sides of the same man. The man of faith versus the man of unbelief. Not two separate individuals. We're talking about one man. Even before Jacob realizes his true self in Christ, he looks like Esau. He dressed in Esau's skin. The unbelieving goat skin of Esau. The natural man. This verse is also equivalent and sometimes translated as I am the one who is gracious and merciful. Now, at this point, Paul does seem to anticipate our own twisted logic that we're going to start accusing God of not being fair by hardening some people. Up till now, the, the question was, is God fair to bless the undeserving? But Paul also does deal with the flip side, is God fair to to harden the unbelieving. And he answers this in three parts. So get your Bible out. I don't have time to read all these verses. You can look it up, have some homework here. In Romans 9, 19 through 21, he talks about the, the God being the potter and you being the clay. Point one on the fairness scale, God can do whatever he wants. Now this doesn't sound nice, but it has to be stated. We don't like the analogy of being called a lump of dirt, but at least you're the lump of dirt that he's married to. We don't like this part of the answer to God's fairness, it seems like God can still be whimsical and malevolent, uh, but that's just because you've been looking at things through that old double predestination mindset. He says, uh, who are you to talk back to God? He's not saying, shut up, you're not allowed to ask questions. What he's literally saying here is clay doesn't even have a mouth. How are you? It's impossible for you to even speak. It is impossible for you to pander on arguing about the goodness of God to Mr. Goodness himself. So, point number one, God can can legally harden. He is God. It's a fact. He's the boss. But this still doesn't answer the ethical question that we're all asking of why he would do it. Point number two Paul goes into is a little bit better. Starting in verse 22 of chapter 9, we see that his hardening is a hardening of some in order to let others in. The Jews were hardened uh, to kill their own Messiah so that the Gentiles could be included. Now Paul rambles on. He tells the Gentiles not to be conceited about this, etc., etc. Uh, then all through Romans 10, he goes into, you know, it's about faith. It's not about human effort. But this still looks exclusive, doesn't it? The Jews still seem to get the short end of the stick. God can harden, and God hardens some to let in others, but the ethical question of his goodness is still on the table. But Paul has been building up to a secret point number three up his sleeve the whole time, which he finally unleashes in Romans chapter 11, that God has ultimately handed all over to disobedience so that he may have mercy to all. All of Israel will be saved. If those Jewish branches were broken off from the root of God, God is able to graft them in again. Why is this scandalous? It is scandalous because it is clearly one of the most universal passages in the Bible. Far from being an exclusive or, or indicating that God intentionally hates some, it is a radically inclusive passage that provides hope for all men. Paul is clearly not just saying that all spiritual Israel will be saved. He's specifically talking about natural hardened Israel. Read chapter 11. Come on. God is, is not a racist either, so he's not saying that all of Israel will be saved, but South Africa's going to hell in a handbasket. Look, Point three is he has actually hardened all so that he can have mercy on all. Each individual has an Esau who must be rejected by God so that his true Jacob is called forth into inheritance. Jacob is disguised in his brother's goat skin until his true identity is revealed. Every individual, every fallen Adamic self is an Esau. With the seed and image of God, the chosen Jacob, hidden inside in a hidden way, vessels of wrath become vessels of honor. All humanity is united in Christ, whether they know it or not, feel it or not, like it or not, believe it or not. Some try to resist their inclusion, but at the height of the Israelites' resistance to God, they crucified their own Messiah, backhandedly opening a door for their own salvation. Like Joseph's brothers selling him into Egypt, they backhandedly lifted him into the king's palace where he would eventually save the whole family, even them. What you meant for evil, Joseph said, God used for good. The vessels of wrath are executing at the same time both their own wicked will 
and the gracious will of God simultaneously. You can resist him all you want, but you can never, ever, ever stop him from including you. This is why when sin abounds, grace all the more abounds. You're either in him experiencing the joys of resurrection, or you're in him demanding to get a judgment which he's already born on your behalf. If you don't know your identity as a holy saint, you will always be striving in your willpower to become holy, to generate favor, and you can never ever earn grace because it ceases to be a free gift and therefore ceases to be grace. You can't make yourself be accepted. You can't change yourself from Esau to Jacob. You can't make yourself be chosen. The church, unfortunately, not knowing its own identity, is still striving to be the church. It's striving to be the church of Jacob, which it already is, and so it goes on in a perpetual fear of Esau, a perpetual fear of rejection, lost inheritance, and a hell that has been overcome and his gates cannot contain us. It's the grace of God that he does not bless all our efforts to climb the ladder ourselves. It is his grace that he hardens and blinds Israel. It is his grace that he kicks Adam out of the garden so he doesn't live forever in a twisted, corrupted state. It is not that he has some get a yes and others get a no. It's that sometimes the yes comes in a package of no. God's patient bearing with the vessels of wrath to an expected end cannot be seen as contradictory victory to election as if they're two separate purposes of God. It's the same purpose. His no always corroborates his yes. Hidden in his no, hidden in the operation of his wrath, God is actually being gracious towards men. It's his grace that he hardens some, their own grace. God has been saying no to Israel throughout their entire rebellious religious history, but hidden all along in the law and the prophets and Israel's failure was God's eternal yes in Christ. The whole goal of hardening, blinding, rejecting is to cause you to reject your religion. Blinding is the curse of the Pharisee that, like Saul, blinded on the road to Damascus, he might eventually see. The religious man thinks his choosing God overcomes his old man, but it's a self-willed assertion that you're going to save yourself. It indicates that you're actually living by that old man. The old man is a religionist. Karl Barth said this. He says, the man who selects God must make way for the man who is selected by God. You cannot self-generate the new man. In the middle of it all, God deals a devastating blow to man's willing and man's running. It is not to him who wills and runs, but God who shows mercy. Bart also says this. He says, We must recognize that this hardening is no more than a temporal condition of mankind. Eternity, as the boundary of time, is the end of time. As the primal origin of time, it is the goal, the exhaustion of human possibility, clearly presupposes the possibility of God. The death of the old presupposes the birth of the new. In Christ, rejection has been swallowed up in election. Christ himself is the fullness of the Gentiles, and he shall turn ungodliness from Jacob. That is, he shall peel back the veil of Esau. He shall remove the sinful nature. He's done it. The death of Jesus unites the elected and the rejected. So, Somebody's going to say, are you a universalist then? Is that what you're trying to say? No! Are you saying there's no hell? No! I am a hopeful universalist. I believe that hell is an eternal life sentence, but I'm also not going to write off all the overwhelming number of passages that do suggest the opportunity for parole. A dogmatic universalist, however, makes presumptive claims about hell either not existing or just being temporary, and I'm not going to do that. But I do have hope. If you don't have hope that everybody makes it out of hell and you want their fat to fry in the flames, well, guess what? You're probably going there yourself, my friend. Even God has this hope. He wants all men to come to repentance and a knowledge of the truth, and I'm content to leave these things in the dialectical tension of mystery. I know that makes my universalist friends angry, and it also makes my Calvinist Arminian friends angry because I won't draw hard lines where no hard lines exist. Look, I don't know all the answers. I don't know why some have faith and others don't, but I do embrace the mystery, as Paul calls this, and I think that the safest place to stay is in the humility of hope. We'll talk more about this next week. That's all our time, but we have hours of teaching on this, a full five-part election series, like I said, available at W 
www.johncrowder.net. It's got a whole teaching on hell on that series as well. It's stuff I promise you're not going to hear anywhere else. It's a hot topic right now. Mazel tov. Sunday morning is every day for all I care. And I'm not scared. Light my candles in our days because I found God. Yeah.